We are not responsible for your behaviour. We believe in common sense. Of course I voted bloody Tory. What do you think I am? Some kind of mamby-pamby socialist? This is Strange But True Radio News Talk with Philip Keeler and Philip Jones. You're listening to News Talk on Strange But True Radio, episode 14 of 2021. On today's podcast, we've got uh, news on Tigray, uh, Brexit, Mayor and Pennies. Uh, we are heard wherever you get your podcasts from, including Apple, Google and Spotify. Find us also on the YouTube channel uh, that we're currently broadcasting live to, if you're uh, on YouTube at the moment. And this is Strange But True Radio for a mixed up generation. Welcome, Philip Jones. While many people around the world stayed home due to COVID-19, we can reveal that almost 2,000 people were massacred in Tigray, the northern Ethiopian province, has been fighting since November 2020. So the Prime Minister launched an offensive on Tigray as he wanted to increase the uh, federal government's power, minimising the regional government's uh, power and uh, then push for centralisation. So it's all about centralisation in uh, in Ethiopia. Um, Phil, what is coming out of Ethiopia uh, sounds very shocking to me and probably a lot of people uh, listening tonight. Um, I understand the reports of deaths have been compiled by a university in, in, in Belgium, in fact. Is that right? It seems to be. I don't know, to be honest, how, where they get their information from, but that does seem to be the case. Uh, Belgium did have quite a large presence in Africa, so, um, you know, you've heard of Belgium, Congo and things like that, so the Belgian did take over and dominate big chunks of Africa. Ah, so that... Like in the 1800s. Yeah, so that makes that makes uh, a bit of sense that uh, a Belgian university would be uh, involved in that, I suppose. Uh, why is there a conflict? Oh, because um, the Prime Minister of, or the President of... Uh, Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed, is um, trying to, he wants to unify Ethiopia, but the northern region of uh, the country doesn't want to be as unified. So they are rebellious, they're rebelling against the domination of the central government. Simple as that, really. So they stay, they're said to have stolen some weapons from um, the government, I don't know, coffers, and they, the government have reacted. Yeah, I get the impression that Tigray is sort of sort of annexed, and uh, basically they they want it all back and to to take take charge of the country. And obviously, the people in Tigray uh, don't don't want that. No, they want to retain an, an, an element of in, independence. They are Eritrea is a country just north of the border of northern Ethiopia, so it borders Tigray, and then Tigray is the northernmost state of Ethiopia. Ethiopia has a population of 110 million people. Six percent of those people, or just over six million people live in Tigray. Now, it seems that the popular people's the, the popular people's liberation front um, the Tigray people's liberation front, sorry um, <clears throat> were a powerful party in Ethiopian politics and at one time may have had a, a, a powerful influence and in fact been in charge of Ethiopia. Well, OK. Um, and, and this conflict has been going on since, I think, November 2020. Um, I'm quite shocked that we don't really know much about this. It hasn't been in our news. I mean... I don't think this is uncommon. I think a lot of things, a lot of the um, unrest in Africa is not reported. I mean, there have been 
uh, purported to be a genocide of 10 million people in the Congo over the past decades, which just hasn't been reported at all anywhere. Terrible, terrible atrocities occur in Africa, and we're not told about them. We're yeah. just not told about them. Yeah, and a, a lot, a lot of them. Um, I think, it, although under the under the banner of the fact that we are allowed and provided with all the news that's available, I don't think that's the case because it's not. It doesn't affect us that much. What goes on in directly, indirectly, it does, but not. We're not that interested in what goes on in Africa. We're more interested in what goes on in Europe and the United States in the English speaking world. Yeah, yeah. For example, a lot, a lot goes on in South America, but we're never told anything that goes on in South America. We're not told a lot that goes on in the Far East, really. <clears throat> we know some stuff. You can find out some things because we do a lot of trade with China, so therefore, people want to know about it. But we don't do. The same type of trade with Africa, so um, we're not told about the social, the civil unrest that goes on there that much. Yeah, and a, a lot of it's a lot of it's funded by um, I, I think it's European arms dealers, people like that. It was pretty shady crew um, selling selling our guns, to, selling guns and killing yeah. people basically. Yeah. yeah. I, I suppose, uh, is there any sort of oil and stuff like that out in Ethiopia that the Western world would be interested in? Is that maybe um, why don't we don't know hear? the natural resources of Ethiopia, but I do know, say, for example, that um, Nigeria is oil rich. Yes. There are diamonds, there is diamonds, gold, silver, precious, other precious stones... All manner of resources are available in Africa and can be found and mined in Africa and exploited in Africa, which they are. As a consequence of that, there's a big, big chunks of uh, Africa are being bought by the Chinese. So the Chinese are infiltrating Africa in a big way. Wow. Okay. I never thought that actually of the Chinese. I know they're, I know they're uh, heavily into uh, Britain at the moment and the UK. And uh, getting into America, but I never thought about Africa. It's not. I mean, it's not something that we're told about. It's not common knowledge. But China are doing, you know, building roads, factories, all sorts of things, because you know China's got two billion people. It's got only a limited land mass, so it's looking for other areas to expand into. I would. I would be. I would be very surprised if China aren't infiltrating Australia, for example. Yeah, yeah. I know that Japan, Japan is, which is a very small island, which is very, very densely populated, owns huge tracts of Australia. Large amount, of, large amounts of Australia have been bought by Japanese conglomerates. Um, now you're so, a bit of a traveller, Phil, aren't you? Um, have I you, like to think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you've told us lots of fantastic stories about being in, in Peru. I'm going to shut the budgie up in a minute. It's um, <laughs> Causing a lot of noise. We'll do that in the break, listener. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah, have you been to Africa? Have you explored Africa? No, not yet. No, I've been to North Africa. I've been to Morocco. Yeah. Years ago, I met the um, blue men, the Tuareg, in a tribe in on the edge of the Sahara Desert when I was 22, which was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. They gave me mint tea in a massive tent oh, on wow. the edge of a desert where there was a civil war going on. Did they, you feel safe with a civil yes. war going on around you? Yes. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was on the edge <laughs> of the civil war. I mean, the, the war was going on in the Sahara, but we, we, we weren't near any of the fronts. There was no f- front near us. We saw we were driving through the desert to the last oasis before the desert proper, a place called Goulamine in southern Morocco, central southern Morocco, and the disputed territory was the Sahara Desert, and that's where the war was going on, as far as I recall. And on the way to Goulamine, sorry, we were in Goulamine, and then we decided to go further into the desert to the last oasis, which I can't remember the name. Really isolated, fantastic place. A few adobe houses and nobody there we could see. And uh, on the way there, on the road, we went past a lot of tanks on the back of tank transporters, massive lorries carrying tanks towards the front. How did that feel? You know, you seeing these tanks and everything. How, how, how did you feel about that? Did I feel frightened? Was I frightened? No. I told my friends not to take any pictures because if we got seen taking photographs of these 
uh, our tanks on the tanks transporters, we could have been arrested or something unpleasant could happen to us. Yeah. We were very young, so they probably wouldn't have done anything to us, but it was a dangerous situation, I suppose. But just driving through, nothing happened. They didn't stop us. We just saw it. We were quite surprised. We didn't realise we were that close to the war itself. And then when we got to this tiny little oasis town called Gulamine, we stopped there overnight in like a hotel that cost a pound a night. And the wow. the, ho- the shower was a couple of bo- plastic bottles with water in because they didn't have a lot of water. So you just poured that over your head. That's how you washed yourself in the shower. It was brilliant. And then the next day we decided to go to the f- final oasis. So we drove across the desert and we found a small settlement with sort of a few adobe houses. And there was no one there. And then suddenly somebody appeared from nowhere and said hello. We said hello. There was three <laughs> of us, me and two of my mates. I spoke French, and I was chatting to him. He was a school teacher, and he said, "Would you like to meet the Tuareg?" So we said, "Okay, that would be great." So we went. We were taken around the corner, and there were these huge. No, I don't. You call them massive, very low, quite those massive nomadic tents, where they sit and drink tea. Yeah. And um, we were shown. Then we, I think I can't remember which way round it was, but we went into the tea, to the tent, and we were in front. We were presented to the to, to the head honcho, and he gave us some tea, like a mint tea, very strong mint tea in a glass with with a lump of sugar that you you break off a piece of sugar off a huge chunk of sugar. And it's very sweet. You drink that with them, which is very nice. They gave me a hammer to break sugar off in the future. Gave me some eyeliner, which is like a little silver holder in it, you know, and a little silver thing you dip in it to do eyeliner on your eyes, um, and which is quite nice. And a t-shirt. I gave them a t-shirt. That's about it. I got a good deal out, out of it. <laughs> anyway, so then we went to the. We were taken out. Oh no! The next day, we went down back to the same place to make sure it wasn't a tourist trap, and it wasn't. We met the guy again. He said, "Come with me." So we went out into the desert proper, uh, this great flat plain, and where there were at least a hundred camels wandering about. And when camels wander, they all walk together across the desert. Sounds like rain. Quite. Quite beautiful. What an experience, though. Oh, it was amazing. It was truly amazing. I mean, you can't beat that, really. I was only, as I say, I was only 22. And the Tuareg said to me, would you like to come across the desert with us? And I said, no, thank you. I had to go back to London. But now, in retrospect, I was a fool. I should have gone, but I didn't. I mean, because you, I was worried. I mean, it was a different time. People didn't travel in the same way. Um, there was a lot of army presence. There was a lot of army presence in Morocco at that time, Morocco it being a different culture, mm. there wasn't really a tourist industry there. There were very few tourists who went to Morocco. At the time, there were people put in jail for any amount of marijuana, and then you get locked in a you got locked in a pretty appalling conditions, and then you would have to pay a fine to get out, pay a big chunk of change to get to the authorities to get out, which is a big bribe basically because i knew a guy who got arrested he was a builder i knew he told me he'd been in jail in morocco uh, uh, like with 30 people in a, in a big in a big room all sharing a, a room and he had to he had to get some quite a lot of money at the time say the equivalent of something like i'd say three thousand or five thousand pounds paid to the authorities in order to get him out so once the authorities found out who he, he was obviously European, they know that he's got access to money. So they said, right, if you pay us X amount, then you can get out. Otherwise, you can stay in jail until they let him out in pretty appalling, cramped conditions. Very rough. Wow. So it's quite do- – you could get – you could get dope put – you could get dope put on you, you know, like planted on you. And then before you knew it, you are in jail and writing home saying, hello, Dad, can you give me – the equivalent of five grand. I need to be locked, let out of jail, please. Yeah. And that's what happened to this guy. He told me about it. And then, so we were there, um, and we were very wary of what we where we went and what we did. We had to be. We basically thought we had to be careful. We had to be very careful. 
but you felt you felt safe or safe safeish which that's a really interesting story I, I, would you do that again would you go out there again oh without doubt i'd yeah. go back to see the tuareg and ask him if i could go do you remember f- so many years ago meeting some people from europe and you said would you would you, you ask one of them if you'd like to go with you across the desert i am that person I was 22 then. I'm a lot older now. Can I come across the desert with you? Mm. If they say yes, I would go. I bet the stars are spectacular in that desert. We, I have no recollection of seeing the stars at night in the desert. <laughs> None whatsoever. Is that, I must have seen them. Is that because you were drunk on tea? Yeah, drank too much mint <laughs> tea. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that. This is Strange But True Radio. Uh, you're with Phil Jones and Philip Keeler. Um, we're going to be talking about Brexit. Now, Brexit is Phil's favourite subject. Um, and, uh, you know, um, we'll be finding out his, um, his views about Brexit and whether we're happy being an island nation. Uh, all these months into to uh, Brexit. Stay with us. This is Strange But True Ready. We're going to take a break. Back right after this. So we're talking about Brexit is is Phil's favourite subject. I quite like talking about Brexit as well, you know. Um, I thought it'd be nice or or maybe not nice to see how Brexit is uh, is doing in the UK. Uh, Some people were very happy we split from Europe and maybe it has helped us uh, get the vaccine a lot quicker and in larger numbers. Uh, Various EU countries are now fighting each other for supply. Uh, We did our own deal and looked after our own first. Uh, Phil, um, 
What about you? Are you happy that、uh, we are this lovely, glorious island nation again? I think it's a joke. Do you? It's all a farce. It's all a farce. This is a farce. What you've been, what you believe, what you've just told me, or the listener, is absolute rubbish. There's no, we gain no. The vaccine rollout has nothing to do with Brexit because we're all independent as far as vaccine rollout rollout is concerned. The EU do not have jurisdiction over how we administer vaccines or how we make them or anything else. They're wanting some of our vaccine back, though, aren't they? Yeah, but that's that's an independent thing. It's nothing to do with Brexit. If we had been members of the European Union at this time, we would per- be perfectly entitled to administer our vaccine. Vaccine program in exactly the same way as we've done it now, and the reason why people are, are, are saying that、uh, this is a this is a this is a shows that Brexit has helped us is for political gain because what re- the real reason why we have Brexit is because on 31st of January 2021,、um, all offshore accounts and finances had to be declared. As members of the EU, so any politician、yeah. who's got an offshore account which isn't paying any tax had to declare it, and none of the politicians in Parliament wanted that at all because they've got most of them have got, <laughs> sorry, a high proportion of them have offshore accounts. Quite a lot of them. So, yeah. yeah. So they were lobbying to get Brexit done by that time, so that they wouldn't be called to account for all the money they've got offshore, because they're they're the people who. Who create the tax laws? They're the people who tell everybody you've got to pay this much tax and everything else, while they aren't paying any tax at all because all their money's offshore.、Mm. So the last thing they want is for the people to know that, and that's the real reason why Brexit happened. So I'm serious.、Yeah. I'm not joking.、Okay. That is the real reason for Brexit, and all this other stuff is a load of nonsense to lie to us. So if we look at the article relating to From the bit, this is from the BBC.、Yeah. Auntie has written an article, and it says how tampon tax, hedgerows, and sanctions have changed since Brexit. So the first bit it points towards. Oh, sorry, it says the full impact of the UK's departure will not be known for years. Yeah, but here's five examples given by ministers in speeches, statements, or on social. In the three months since the end of the transition period, to say some advantage that's been given or created by Brexit. Okay, so the first one, let's we'll go through them. It won't take long. Tampon tax, a cut in VAT for tampons and sanitary products, was the first Brexit dividend announced by the Chancellor Rishi Sunak on the first of January, the day after the end of the transition period. Absolute lie. It's a barefaced lie. The EU had no control over VAT, none. Okay. All the EU said was, "When you've set your VAT, please tell us how much it is." But no control of our taxes, no influence on our taxes, nothing, zero, nothing.、Mm. So that's Rishi Sunak, the He is the Chancellor of the Exchequer, lying. Yeah, that's a barefaced lie. People should he should be taken for task for that. So you can't trust Rishi Sunak. Second, points-based immigration. The UK's new points-based immigration system also came into the first force on the, which I think is a farce anyway. But all this business about immigration, we had control. We were able to control. The people who came into the UK, there were rules applied to that. So, if you came into the UK, you had to have an amount of money to survive with it, under your own finances. Otherwise, you couldn't stay here. You were given a, the law of the EU said if you go to a,、um, a member state and see, search for work, you must find your,、uh, gainful employment with a, within a period of time. Otherwise, you will have to leave. If you're if you're looking for work, or you're or you can't support yourself, because if you've been here for a period of time, you could not, you were unable, basically you were unable to get benefits. You couldn't get benefits until you've been working here for a period of time. Yeah, that's right. There were no benefit holidays. You just couldn't come here, claim benefits, and say, "Oh, great, I'm living in England." 
you just it was illegal but the uk system was so useless sorry the uk administration was so useless they weren't able to follow the rules set by the eu the eu rules were here to protect the uk from uh immigrants coming here on a benefit holiday but then all the but none of the i don't think the mp most of the mps understood that either and they were just jumping on a bandwagon saying oh we've got all these immigrants now and they're just coming over from the from, from uh, EU states to take our benefits, so we have to pay them benefits because we're over the EU. That's not true. That was a lie. Um, there was an article by the Daily Mail, I believe, that said that millions of Bulgarians and millions of people from Romania were waiting to come over to England. They were waiting to come over to England and take all our benefits from us. And and um, this is on the headlines, and a lot of people thought this was true. It was an absolute lie mm. by the media to try, and it created bigotry and racism within our country, and it was divisory, de- do, divisory and derisory. Do we know where that came from? I think it was the Daily Express. Okay. Could have been the Daily Mirror. It's the Daily Express or the Daily Mirror, one of those the two. The newspapers, yeah, because... Well, broadcasting is supposed to be a bit more impartial. I don't think uh, Farage uh, had a uh, did well made things uh, any better, really, with what he said. Everything, everything that Nigel Farage said was a lie. Yeah, he didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't understand the EU, and he didn't understand how it worked. Nigel Farage did not have a degree. When he went to a conference in Germany a few years ago, um, he got a bit drunk at the bar. And it was then he decided that we should leave the EU. If Nigel Farage was at a conference, an EU conference in Germany, he would have been surrounded by other MEPs who were all highly educated. Most of them have doctorates. Most of them have doctor. They're doctor this or doctor that. Most of the MEPs on the continent are highly educated. Farage was an uneducated oaf. So not, I doubt very many them would want to have a conversation with him and most of them wouldn't bother because he's not of their intellect he doesn't have their intellectual capabilities he's got a nice voice though hasn't he i can't stand the man i think he's absolutely appalling i think he looks more like bart simpson than everybody than anybody else except bart mm. simpson's more makes more sense move on to sanctions the Bre- brexit means that we've put iran is in a poor economic state because it's got sanctions put up against it by the US and other economies because they say we, we can't deal with Iran because the US have put sanctions up against Iran so that means they have to they can't get the they can't trade as much as they'd like to and it's it's um, stifling their economic activity so it's making them a poor country and isolated the UK is talking about we can put sanctions up against China mm. we didn't we don't have to do that because the EU already do that the EU are much more powerful and they're involved in in trying to 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 point the Chinese towards greater human rights, which is kind of ironic because the English are now the UK are now saying, oh, we're going to put up rights because we don't we're going to put up sanctions against China. No, they're not. It's just they're just telling us they are, but of course they're not. They're not doing that. They're just does they're making out they are. Of course they're not. They won't do anything. And then we move on. We go tax whis- tax on whiskey exports. I can't really say that. Um, Imports of Scotch whisky to the United States um, are going to maintain the tax, or otherwise, I don't know. I think this is I think this is a red herring. We had twenty two percent. That is twenty two percent of all our international trade was undertaken with the United States of America prior to Brexit. That's a massive amount of trade. So 50% of our international trade was done with the European Union and 22% was done with the United States. We had a brilliant agreement with the United States whilst we were members of the EU. Of course, as as we're no longer members of the EU, the EU trade agreement that we had as members no longer exists. Mm. So we have to make a new one. But we don't have the same clout that we had as members of the EU because we're a population of 60 million and the population of Europe is 500 million. So we're tiny. We're just 12% of the population. Yeah. So we don't 
we don't have anywhere near the clout we used to as members. They say, oh, taking back control. No, we've given away control to the EU. We've given it all away. And it gets worse. The e the Brexit, the Brexit, I don't know, s- statute produced because of, uh, because of Brexit means that now ministers in London can make laws without having them voted through Parliament. Mm. Totally undemocratic. Our democracy is being taken away from us because of Brexit. Before, any law that was passed in this country had to pass through Parliament. Now, ministers can make their own laws. Phenomenally dangerous. Yeah. We no longer have the democracy that we had. Because of Brexit, and Farage was saying, "Oh, take back control." We've given away control. We're giving so effectively those ministers who can make laws, albeit they say they're related to trade. That could be anything. You could say, you could just do whatever you wanted in theory. If you've got the right to make a law, you can do what you like. Really bloody dangerous. They've taken away a big chunk of our democratic process because of Brexit, which means we're living more under a dictatorship than we ever have before. Yeah, yeah. So It's really dangerous, but people aren't aware of that. You're obviously, you're obviously set against uh, Brexit. Have you ever been on a protest, Phil? Yes. What was that for? Brexit, anti-Brexit. Oh, wow. Okay. Did you go into London and, and do the marching and stuff? Yeah, two. I did two. Wow. Wow. Because it's important, I think, a million people there. Yeah. And um, it was really important. People were going out on the streets saying, we don't want this. It was the pro-Brexit people. There was hardly anybody. And it seemed to me that all the people, the mood was that the majority of people didn't want Brexit. Mm. Because you see a lot of people say, oh, there was a vote. We had a referendum. Well, um, it was a non-binding referendum. It was only that Cameron said, oh, I'm going to make it binding. Well, he's not the law. He can't make it a law. It has to be voted through Parliament to make it a law. Yeah. And Cameron said, oh, I'm making it binding. Well, he hasn't got, he's, not, he's not got the power to do that. So that was a farce in itself because nobody picked him up on that. The members of Parliament should have done. Do you blame on a minute. Do you blame Cameron, Cameron for all of this? Cuz he you could say started it. Yes, I do. He was afraid that UKIP were going to take some votes off him in mm. parliament. He was a, he's a spineless fool of a man. Yeah. Who's never left the institution. He mummy and daddy are rich, he's wealthy and entitled, no idea what goes on in the real world. Always had far too much money, went to Oxford or something, got I think he got a first how I don't know. Um and he the only thing he knew was studying economics and politics at City of Westminster College, University of City of Westminster, something like that. Yeah. Which is kind of a school for politic- politicians now. <laughs> And I thought you were going to say school for pirates. No, they would be decent. Pirates are quite decent. If you read some of the history of pirates, it's, they're actually quite quite cool. Actually, they're very cool. Anyway, so um, the only thing he knew was what he was taught at university, and what he's taught at university is the theory of economics and the theory of politics. So, mm. if you understand politics, you do politics for politics' sake to maintain your position and keep power. But you see, politics for politics sake isn't what it's about. Politics is there to benefit the populace, Mm. manage a country, you're managing a country. You're not creating an image to maintain your power at all costs because that's the dichotomy. That's the oxymoron of politics because often to do the right thing might make you not look quite as good as doing the wrong thing. Mm. So what a lot of politicians, most pol- most politic, most of what politicians do is to create an impression to give people the idea that they're doing the right thing when in fact they're doing the opposite to the right thing. So for example, they're saying we want to reward the work farmers do to manage every metre of hedgerows on their holdings because sustainably, Environmental Secretary George Eustace sold the Oxford Farming Conference in February. He said. Farmers previously could not apply for money to help protect hedgerows from the EU's common agricultural policy because they were dubbed ineligible features. 
fine. So why didn't the government provide a grant for them? Why mm. didn't the UK government provide a grant for them, as they are doing now? It didn't. No, the EU never stopped providing a grant for head throw maintenance. They said, we're not going to provide one, but you're welcome to if you want to. So the so what exactly what that's exactly George Eustace has made out that the EU were blocking hedgerow hedgerow maintenance grants. Yeah. Absolute lie. Mm. A total lie. A sham. All of this. It's a disgrace. <laughs> but people don't the problem I have, you see, the difficult the difference with my perception of this and other people's perception is this, is because I've worked in Spain as a lawyer. Yeah. I've worked in South America as a lawyer. I've worked in California as a lawyer. I've worked in London as a lawyer. I've worked in the city. I've traveled a lot. And I've been around the block. And I've studied EU law for many years. So I know what the truth of it is, and I, re I read the law reports, for example, when Cameron was out in the EU in, on the continent telling us all they wouldn't do what he asked, so we're going to have to have a referendum. No. The EU said, we will do whatever you ask, Mr Cameron. And when he came back from Brussels at the meeting at the end of 2012, he turned up and he spoke out and he said, the EU won't do as we ask. We need to do something about this. We're going to have a referendum. Complete and utter lie. Utter nonsense. Do you ever see us going back in the EU? If we had some politicians with a brain cell, more than one brain cell, this lot have got one collectively, as far as I can tell. It could happen with Labour, don't you think? It's possible. I think it's unlikely. Hmm. Because I think it, it depends on the mood of the country. If enough people stood up and said, actually, we're fed up with this, you know, because, I mean, say, for example, there's a couple of things. Let's think of a couple of Okay, the fishing industry was a big turning point. They said, okay, it's only very small percentage of, uh, less than 1% or something, I can't remember, percentage of our economic activity with the EU. But they hmm. were making out as a massive deal with the fisheries, and the fishery people thought, well, they're controlling our fishing too much. But you see, what they failed to realise was a lot of the fish processing plants were in the UK. So the French catch their fish in wherever, and then they make that they process the fish in the UK and then send it across to the continent. A lot of mass proportion of our fish that British fishermen caught was sent over to the continent as well. Now they can't sell it because of the Brexit deal the Tories got it was dreadful. So there are there are there are export barriers in place so we've put sanctions up against ourselves, just like they did in Iran, like, like the Americans put up against Iran. We've put them up against ourselves. How stupid is that? So we can't export our fish to France and Europe, well, the rest of continental Europe, in the same way we did before. So it rots and dies, and people go out of business because it's stinking in the lorries, because they can't get over sick, can't get across. Can't, they over quick enough. Paperwork and bureaucracy is mm. terrible. Yeah. And that's not the only industry. Pork. Pigs have to be sold at a certain weight at a certain time. If you put the bureaucracy in the way and the, and, and the prices go up because of that, the pigs don't get sold and then they get big and you have too big to shift and then you have to keep feeding them or just slaughter them, slaughter them and throw them on the skip. But the pig farmers are in dire straits now. They don't know what to do. Because they've got all these pigs at various stages that were sent for slaughter at a certain time, or they were, or they were bred at a certain time. You know, I don't know how it works exactly, but you know, they, there were specific times relating to the to the movement of animals to be exported. They can't comply with those anymore because of Brexit. People don't talk about it. They just say, "Oh, we've got a few hedgerows we can fix," which is a lie in itself. <laughs> Tampon tax is that the best you can do, Rishi Sunak? Tampons. <laughs> Tampon tax, sort yourself out. I mean, it's a joke. <laughs> People take this seriously. And then the points based immigration, when the UK government couldn't even get that right when we were members of the EU. And then they're blaming the EU for their own failure. It goes on and on and on and on. And nobody speaks out in this way, and I think they should. But maybe they haven't studied it enough. I don't know. But it's an absolute joke, and it makes us a laughing stock. On the continent, when, I've, when I was in Spain last, they used to say, well, why are you leaving the EU? 
I said, because we're bloody stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's an idiot called Nigel Farage. He's right, got a load of sheep to follow him. You know, go, bah, <laughs> like that. That's what they sound like, meh. And then you question them and say, give us a, give us one Brexit. Okay, you want to, you want us to leave the EU, give us one Brexit benefit. And they go, um, don't know one, I haven't got one. There is a well, benefit. Why are you then? There okay? is a there is a benefit for leaving the EU. The one benefit. We don't have to listen to Nigel Farage as much. <laughs> okay, we're going to be talking about the mayoral elections next taking mm-hmm. place in London. We're going to be going through some of the candidates. Uh, I thought you'd uh, might uh, like to appreciate it. There's some very good candidates and some very Silly candidates called Miss. Is no. there one called Mr. Bin Man or something like that? But I don't know. Have a look. Okay, we'll be back with you right after this. We're going to take a short break. I'm Phil Keeler. He's Phil Jones. This is Strange but True Radio. Do stay with us.
Welcome back. The London mayor elections take place on the 6th of uh, May 2021. But who are the candidates taking part? As uh, usual, there's some very serious candidates and uh, not so serious uh, candidates as well. Although wanting to make their mark and impact on London's decisions, it's an important job as he or she is charged with uh, making London a better place and uh, the areas they look after are, uh, of course, for the locals and visitors, including culture, business, environment, health, police and uh, transport, as well as a host of other areas. Um, So, Phil, I thought it would be uh, nice for us to go through uh, a few of the candidates. There there are a lot out there. Um, Sadiq Khan, um, let's start with him. He's he's the current uh, uh, mayor of London, of course. Uh, He was elected in 20. Uh, 16 with a a vote of 44.2 percent which is uh, quite good I suppose Um, and so he's going to be in the ring uh, trying to be uh, re-elected. Sadiq Khan says he has he done a good job do you think? He seems to have done a lot of people think that he hasn't I mean his Mm. popular popularity is not what it was I don't think but I can't put a finger on anything that he has done wrong, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, and his nickname is Sadik Kant, isn't it, unfortunately? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why they call him that. Yeah. He doesn't seem to have done anything, as I say. Any, oh, it's his... I'll tell you what it was. It was knife crime. Yeah. They said he didn't do enough to combat knife crime after all the Tories sacked the police. Yeah, I mean, they, they got rid of the police from London, exactly. a lot of them. Exactly. If you have a lot of crime, what do you do? Sack the police if you're the Tories. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense, doesn't it? Mm. It's about as much use as a chocolate teapot, the Tories are. So if you, have a lot of, if you have a lot of knife crime, then what you do is you increase the number of police, particularly the number of police walking around on the street. And that's some kind of deterrent as opposed to get rid of them. So because they said that he didn't address the knife crime sufficiently, so that's why his popularity has gone down. I don't know if he should be blamed for that. Mm. I would suggest he shouldn't be blamed for that because he had to live under a regime of morons. Yeah. And so there's a, a Tory candidate called Sean Bailey, who's uh, 48. He's the son of a lorry driver. He's also in the running. Um, he's a, a, a black person uh, from Jamaica. Um, I would have thought he could do quite well. Although he is conservative. Yeah, we don't really do. like conservatives. But except he's a Tory, so who needs that? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of Labour. Per- there's a lot of there's a, a big chunk of people in London are Labour voters. You yeah, thought they're all Tories, yeah. but they're not. Yeah, not anymore. Yeah, um, I mean, in L- London was full of people who didn't want to leave L- leave the EU. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's a Green candidate. Uh, the Greens co-leader uh, will be standing. Um, Sean, Sean uh, Berry. Sh- yeah. Sean. 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 Sean, not, yeah, the female version. Sean Berry. Um, I don't know really much about her. Have you any idea? Well, I think if you want to be a member of the Green Party, you'd go and live in the country, wouldn't you? Become a vegan London's or something. Not, London's not exactly green. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's covered in concrete. There's some nice parks, but, you know. That's true, apart from the parks. Okay, apart, you got me. I don't really want a tree hugger um, no. for uh, for uh, mayor. Well, I don't think it, it works in a, in, a, in, a, in a city. I don't think it's the, 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 the most at the forefront of the living in a city is the green aspect. The green, as, the green aspect is relevant, of course. I mean, Sadiq Khan's been kind of closing down the amount of fumes that cars are allowed to exude in the, in the centre of London. He's been cutting back on that, you know, emissions controls and mm. having to pay exorbitant amounts of money to drive into the city. That's That has some control. I mean, personally, I do think that you could clean up London enormously. Um, for example, remove cars from around Trafalgar Square would be a good start. 
And so, yes, green aspect is very, very important, but there are so many other things in London. The green is not at the forefront of those problems. Well, London is one of those areas where they should be uh, putting more electric scooters in the city. Uh, exactly. I think they would be a fantastic thing for everybody exactly. to use. They should be doing more. That should be. That's a very good idea, actually. And although, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe we should have a green. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we should have the Green Party candidate as the leader of the, as the mayor of London, because they could just actually. Maybe the green aspect is the most important thing because, apart from anything else, if you improve your environment, productivity increases. Yeah, but you didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you clean a place up. The economic fr- econ- economy thrives. If you live in a place where you, it's an absolute mess and a dive and, you know, it, it, the air is polluted and everything else, productivity goes down. If you live in a nice, pleasant environment and you work in a nice, pleasant environment, productivity goes up. Yeah. Straightforward. But people don't realise that. Exactly. They think, they think, oh, it's all money, it's all money. No, you 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 make make you have far greater economic activity in a clean environment. And it's ju- true. Just just uh, we've got a few people chatting in in our chat room in uh, in on YouTube live. I'm not a national Trevor Trevor <laughs> treasure. <laughs> I'm not a national treasure. Not yet, anyway. Thank you, Dave. And, yes, you are, Phil. And and ha- happy yes, birthday uh, to Laura. Whose birthday is nice, today as well? Nice, nice to know. Right, so, so let's go. Got, yeah, let, we've got to go. Oh, here's Corbin. Oh, here's an interesting one: Valerie Brown burning okay. pink. Mm. Some of them got arrested for throwing pink over um, the Lib Dem Tory Labour Party headquarters in London, I think. Huh. Because they think we should have we should have assemblies rather than politicians running the country. Because they don't they think the government are not doing the, a, a job the job in the way that they should be. Mm, okay, um, quite interesting. They say, um, hold on, what was it? They said I've lost track. <laughs> she's only got she she only has one policy to give power to the people and to tackle the climate crisis. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, it's the climate crisis. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, that's what it is. So yeah. So um, your friend Piers Corbyn is running as an independent. Yeah, but he's well. He's highly educated. He's he's superbly ex- educated. But he's completely and, nuts. Why? Because he believes the pandemic's a hoax and five G so mobile phones caused it. For goodness' sake. Well, I don't know if he said that. Did he say that 5G mobile phone caused yeah, it? Yeah. Oh, dear me. There's a, oh, I think that reason. is Russian it's disinformation. Not, We're going to stop not. there because I don't want to talk about that on this show because I don't think people need to know about that. I, th- I think that okay, is just fair nuts. Enough, fair enough. Anyway, I don't think it's nuts. I think it's, I think, I think it's quite interesting. And he also, he doesn't... Um, the thing about Mr. Corbyn is he doesn't believe in climate change either. Okay. He thinks that's a hoax. But that's quite interesting as well because um, I'm sure there is some fluctuation in the climate, obviously, but is it because of car- carbon, um, de- carbon, what do you call it, carbon deposits or whatever, however they carbon pollution? Or is it because the axis of the earth changes and it fluctuates? It's known to fluctuate. And it, it, if you look at, say, 100 years, 150 years ago, no, when was it? 1600s. 1600s in England, the Thames would freeze over. It got so cold. Yeah, I, I think you're right. With, with Yeah, climate does change over years and it gets warmer and it gets colder and then one day we'll just be obliterated by the sun, won't we? Yes, um, in a few billion years. Yeah. 2,000 years ago, you could grow red, red grapes for red wine in Yorkshire. Okay. The Romans produced red wine in Yorkshire yeah, two thousand years ago, because as but what, what's happening is that these climate conferences they're not discussing the axis of the Earth. All they talk about is carbon emissions. That's all they talk about. And if you ask them about and the, and a guy present, did this massive big presentation at one of these conferences, he got booed off stage. Well, not off stage, but he got booed because he said, "Well, actually, has anybody thought about the change in the Earth's axis?" And they didn't like that because they hadn't thought about it. So they dismissed well, his, his argument as being out of hand. But that must be considered. But no one's doing that. They're just saying, oh, no, it's all carbon emissions. 
blatantly not true. I, I was watching a news article, I'm sure. It was about, oh, it must have been about 20 years ago now. And I'm sure they said that the Earth has changed its access axis uh, during that point. Did you, do you remember anything like that about 20 when years it, ago? When was this? Well, it's about 20 years ago. I'm in my 40s now. It's constantly now. changing. It oscillates. Hmm. 150 years ago in Iceland, they said that the ice was taking over their farmland because it was getting colder 150 years ago. And that land still hasn't come back. It's still got ice on it. Okay. Um, Do you see what I'm saying? So I'm, what I'm saying is 150 years ago, it was warmer than it is now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, But people aren't looking at... Look it up, listener. Look it up and you will see. There's a graph of, of uh, world temperature changes over long periods of time. It's interesting. Here, here's an so, interesting yes, candidate. Go, he's, yeah, I think he's he's very an yeah. intelligent man. He's he seems he's pretty good. What about Lawrence Fox? Because uh, he was an actor, and he's uh, he's running for uh, London mayor uh, with the Reclaim Party. What are the re- yeah? But what do the Reclaim Party stand for? I've really no idea. <laughs> I've no I think, idea. I think well, well, I don't know. He might be all right. He's a good looking lad, and he's been on TV, so he must be good. It's an anti woke movement, that's what it is. Oh good, I like them. Anti woke, that sounds great. Let's have him in power. And he was married to um uh, Billy Piper, who's been married to a lot of famous people re- re- really, hasn't Only she? one other. Only one other. Was that Chris Except... Evans? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. And then we've got Why did he get rid of her? Goodness sake. I don't think it was that way round. Oh. I think it was the other way around. Okay. And then we've got the best candidate could be Count Binface, <laughs> a self-proclaimed interplanetary space warrior who has challenged both Boris Johnson and Theresa May in general elections. Did you say challenged well, or gets, channeled? Challenged. Challenge. Challenged. <laughs> challenged. He's got. He's got. Um, yeah. He's. He wears kind of like an armor. It looks brilliant. He looks like, he looks make a great Ned, Ned Kelly. He looks a bit like Ned Kelly. Yeah. You like a man with a big helmet, don't you, Phil? I do. I do. Yeah. So he maybe maybe he's the candidate for you. Um, he looks a bit like Ned Kelly. Maybe. Maybe he should go to Australia and stand up for Parliament there. He, you never know. He might succeed. That would be quite good. Yeah. <laughs> Who else? Who else is there? Uh, Peter Gammons, UKIP. Peter Gammons. That's what we need. A nice racist. Nice, as, nice racist. A nice, a nice racist <laughs> as the mayor of London. <laughs> One of the most cosmopolitan cities on the planet. Yeah. Let's just whiz through these. Well. Let's do a, we'll do a female. Uh, one female. Uh, just to show you that we're not Vanessa sexist. Hudson, Vanessa Hudson, Animal Welfare Party. Oh, there we go. We'll be all voting for her, will we? I would, yeah. I'm sure she's great. A vegan or something like that. Vegan. The irony about vegans, of course, is if we followed vegan diet without any unnatural man-made supplements, we'd all die. Yeah. Wouldn't so we also be farting you lots? should be a ve- vegan. Well, yeah, but... And then... <laughs> I think that... I think that... <laughs> contributes to global warming i used to have to sit next to a vegan and she absolutely stank like a lettuce and um, no no joke it's she stunk like a lettuce really revolting revolting (laughs) i think that if we did all become vegan well apart if we didn't die um I think it would contribute to the methane layer. Mm. I think it would produce a lot more. Seven billion people producing a massive amount of methane would affect the ozone layer. Yeah. And contribute to global warming. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I don't think the vegans have thought it through quite. (laughs) No. No, we need to eat meat. It's part of the the human food chain. Is that right? 
Well, you can't if you don't have vitamin B12 for long a long period of time, you will die because your mm. immune system won't work properly. Vitamin B12 is only available in p- certain plants, stuffs, plants, but it's very, 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 very low levels. There is a p- specific type of seaweed that's found off the coast of Japan that you could possibly survive without eating meat if you just ate that. Otherwise, you need to eat dairy products to get the vitamin B12. If you don't eat the dairy products, you're only left with vegetables and um, you wouldn't survive. So you have to mm. eat You have to eat to find food. What did you eat I when mean, you were in the Amazon? Oh, um, tourists. <laughs> I didn't really get on with the tourists, so we used to just eat them. Um, what else did we eat? Monkeys. Oh, wow. Snakes, ants, ants, insect, insects in general, big old maggots that look like um, they look like maggots, but the size of your finger. Um, but they say actually the ins- insects are going to be sort of the next thing that people start to eat because they're well, high in protein. It was common. It was common to eat because insects are very high in protein. And and other nutrients. There are restaurants in Mexico that sell nothing but insects. I think Colombia as well. You can. There are certain places you can buy uh, nutritional insects prepared, maybe in in chocolate or something else, something like of that type. Um, I didn't really eat those things in the Amazon. I ate other things. I think <laughs> just chicken and rice, a bit of chicken and rice Aww. fish. Fish, chicken, rice, uh, there are maggots the size of your... F- there are maggots the size of your little finger. Mm. Oh, no, I don't think I could eat those. If not, if they look like maggots, and they're a delicacy. Well, they're not a delicacy. They are a staple f- food for people there. If you go to the market, you can buy them. You can have them skewers grilled, you know, like a snack. A skewer, like a kebab. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're maggots, huge maggots. I, I think I'd eat them if they were, uh, you know, dipped in chocolate. That'd be quite nice. Well, yeah. I'll tell you what's interesting and very sad, and I, you know, it, 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 I found it quite distressing. What they have is like they have these wooden skewers, and they they pierce, they they push the maggots live onto. Bear in mind, these maggots are about an inch long, say a width of your finger, and. Um, they would push them onto the skewers and then they would twist the, They would put the skewers against the fire so like they'd ro- rotate the skewer and the maggots would squeal. Oh. You wouldn't believe it, would you? Maggots squealed. It must have been like a pressure thing though inside. No, they were, scru- they were squirming. They oh. were squealing in pain. Oh. As far as I could tell. You may be right... Someone, if if we've got a listener, they could write in and t- clarify that. But it it looked to me as though they were squealing because they were in pain. It was really, really weird. Mm. Maggots squeak. They were making the sound as though they were screaming. Tiny, tiny little things. Very, very high pitched squeal. Well, on that sad note, um, we're going to leave the London mayoral elections and maggots. And um... well, we can blame Vanessa Hudson for that. Thanks, She's Vanessa. Here. Animal, wel- animal Welfare Party. <laughs> she should be mayor of the countryside or something, where they have lots more animals. Exactly. Okay, we're going to be talking about um, uh, the man, uh, a man from Georgia being given um, his final salary in a very unusual way. He's Phil Jones. I'm Phil Keeler. We'll be back right after this. Do stay with us. <laughs>
A man from Georgia in the USA has received his final salary after quitting his job. Uh, now, you'd expect the company he worked for would, you know, transfer the cash uh, into his bank or, uh, or just, you know, give him a check maybe. But I, I think I'd rather want it going into my bank. Uh, instead, Andreas Fletten, as is his name, different surname, discovered a 90,000 pennies covered in an oily substance at the bottom of his driveway. Um, Phil, have you ever been paid in pennies? Mm. Yeah, when I had a job, the employer always always tried to pay me in pennies. <laughs> as little as possible. Uh, over on, on, on our screen, if you're watching us... <laughs> <laughs> on YouTube, you can see the pennies dumped on his driveway. Apparently, they had had an oily substance on them. I think what was happening here is clearly that the, his ex-employer, after his resignation, wanted to get back at him because he didn't like the fact that he resigned. Mm. He was the, the employer wanted to be a pain in the ass because he probably maybe he was left in the lurch and he owed him nine hundred dollars so that's he thought the most the, the let's be as painful as possible and pay him in pennies which is what he did and then cover them in grease and oil <laughs> so that he had to clean them that's what happened clean I your think. pennies yeah so in england in the states i've been looking and i can't find anything that says that is the limit of um coins that are legal tender so in england for example if you offer coins or notes you must accept them as legal tender however there are limits so um if you pay in any you don't have to accept any more than 20 20 pence in 1p coins oh that's good in england because anything above 20% is no longer legal tender. You have to give them something else. You can say, that's not legal tender. I don't want it. I'll accept 20 pennies and no more. And the same for 2p coins. So that's 20 pence as well. And then for 5 pence coins, you have to accept up to 5 pounds in 5 pence coins as legal tender. And then 10 pence coins is 5 pounds too. 20%, 20 pence coins, you, you have to, this is a pain, but 20, 20 pence coins up to 10 pounds. 50 percent 50 pence coins up to 10 pounds too so then you have you can demand notes after that and then one pound coins is any amount so you could have a million one pound coins that would be painful and then you've got two pound coins is any amount as well so there are limits on the lower denominations of how much you are obliged to accept as legal tender yeah in the united states where i read it they said that any you don't have to if you if you want to sell something to somebody you don't have to accept large denomination notes so like like a hundred dollar bill and you don't have to accept uh pennies for anything either you can say no i don't want it you can keep your money however if somebody offers you all i've found so far and i'm looking so they this could change, but so far all I've found is that it says that you have – if someone offers you pennies in payment, you have to accept them as settlement of a debt. Wow. So okay. it may be that this guy yeah. has said, I've, I, owe, I owe the this mechanic 900 bucks, <laughs> so I'm going to pay him in pennies to settle the debt, and he has to accept the pennies as settlement of the debt. Wow, because they don't have those laws. Because but each state decides yeah. itself. So I looked up Georgia. This is where this has happened, and I couldn't find. I can't find anything that says anything other than what I said, which is um, you have to accept pennies or any notes for a settlement of a debt, but not necessarily for buying something. So, for example, a copy. You decide. Yeah, I I remember when I was in the co-op, when I, well, not in the co-op, when I was working for the co-op, right? And this was Mm -hmm. a long, long time ago, because I was like 16. Mm -hmm. A lot of the old ladies, uh, uh, a lot of the old ladies would nick milk from us. That was a regular occurrence. Um, (laughs) I'd see this milk, I'd see see the milk on, 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 on the conveyor belt and magically it just went into their bag. Uh, and I, of course, just let them because I felt sorry for the older ladies. Seriously? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait a minute. So you were 
accessory to the theft. Yes, but this was a very long, long so you time were admi- ago. You were admitting theft. I, I, there's pos- no, there's mm. no statute of limitation on crime. Kind theft. If anybody, if anybody from the car is listening, <laughs> you go to prison, Phil. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, <laughs> as well as letting them steal milk Someone's and being an accessory to to, to uh, theft. <laughs> Um, they used to often pay me in pennies and five pences. Probably they were probably they probably knew exactly what they were doing. They knew that I couldn't be bothered as a sixteen-year-old boy to actually count the pennies, and they were probably, you know, getting fifty p or a pound off their shopping. Did you just used to look at them and go, "All right, that I went, about yeah, right. That, that's and that's, that's, that's about right," and yes, just chucked it in? Right. That's all right, love. <laughs> You have your milk. <laughs> you have your milk. Maggie Thatcher took it off the kids. So I'll give it to the grannies. Yeah, that's, well, I think that's very socially aware of you to, to do that. I, I, I admire you for that, Phil, giving <laughs> grannies milk. Well, well done. You're a very decent man. We should all give grannies milk, I think. I want... <laughs> <laughs> Let's not be being sexist or ageist. No, no. No, I was just it trying to conjure up how is. we could give like granny's somebody milk. Somebody say no, that's sexist and ages, ages because you're discriminating. Go on. <laughs> um, I wonder how he got the oil off these pennies. Bit of detergent. Oh, he okay. Found a penny from 1937. Yeah, I mean, some could be worth a pretty penny. Yeah, I suppose. I don't know. Yes, there must be some pennies that are very rare. It's the one, you know, if you've got 90,000, then maybe there is one in there that's quite valuable. Yeah, yeah. Um, A friend of mine found a very, very valuable coin that's 2,000 years old last week. Oh, wow. What, in the ground or something? Yeah. Wow, What with a metal detector? detector. He's a detectorist. He's a friend of ours. We've spoken to him. Oh, that man. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He found this amazing, he found an arrowhead, which is over 4,000 years old. Wow. As well, within an hour. And a silver coin, which is BC, so it was it had been carried... So the Romans arrived, I think, in 44 AD. The coin he had was something like 53 BC. So it was an old coin for the Romans that had brought... Someone had brought it over with them. And it was really cool because it had a, a really good image of a... Of a of, a, of, a, of the guy in charge wow. on it. Wow, I would love you, to you find something great. like that. Um, I, I used to I used to metal detect, and uh, uh, my parents uh, lived uh, opposite a place called Pontins, and it was demolished. And uh, so I used to go around the grounds with my dad, and uh, we all we used to find was uh, shells. What kind of shells? Well, from guns, from Akat guns, actually, in the war, from the war, yeah. Really? Yeah. That, so I, oh, I had loads of shells. Was it a defence base, was it, or something? Yeah, they used to... In, in fact, my next-door neighbour to the right, they had an Akak <laughs> gun in their garden. And she's, li- nice. she's, she's listening and watching. She may never know that, actually. I don't think I've ever told her. But uh, apparently that is, that is true. Well, that's very interesting, actually. We haven't got one of those. We've got a 900-year-old... Mound in the garden. Oh right, used to used to be used for ceremonies by druids. You know those guys with the cloaks and the long hats. Right, There's seven yew, seven yew trees in a circle. In the middle of the circle is a stump. The stump represents the devil, and mm. the yew trees keep the devil inside the circle, so the devil devil can't escape. So you need but to get I, a metal detector out. I do. Yeah, that would be fascinating. It would be quite interesting, actually. Yeah, yeah. I suppose you can hire them, can't you? Can you hire them? You can, you can. I'm, I'm so close to sort of buying one. I keep looking on Amazon. I, when I do the night shift, I keep looking at Amazon at 3 a.m. and I buy all sorts of uh, all sorts of plastic rubbish. Tats. 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 You don't need. <laughs> Tats that I don't need. need. Yeah. I've got five record players. <laughs> <laughs> what if I got I know. I think it's a man uh, thing. Does anybody want one? <laughs> I've, got, I've, what, got, I've what, got to get rid of them. What's your favourite record player? <laughs> it's a, actually, it's a Technics. It's a, quite a rare Technics. Is uh, it? Uh, record player. Yeah, it's quite nice. Wow. 
All right, then. So that was Pennies. Uh, thank you for uh, listening. That's it for this edition of Strange But Tree Radio News Talk for a Mixed Up Generation with Philip Jones and myself, Philip Keeler. Uh, join us each and every Saturday evening for a new podcast to download on trending news stories of the week. I know it's not Saturday. If you're watching on YouTube, it's Friday. Uh, but uh, that's when the podcast proper goes out. We're available on a Saturday wherever you get your podcast from from 20 hundred hours british time take care of yourselves